Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you're here with us for worship today. It's beautiful to see you all here. And we're so glad we can be with our friends online. So today we come into this text in John chapter 2. We hear this story of Jesus coming into the temple, the, the holy house, the, the house of worship, Jesus coming in. And it seems like it's rather uncharacteristic of him overturning tables, fashioning a whip. This is just on the heels of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turned thousands of gallons of water into wine in celebration. And here we see something different. We see a zeal for the house of the Lord. We see a zeal represented from Jesus, how it consumes him. What I want you to hear, what I want you to know today, is that this zeal that Jesus demonstrates for us, the zeal that he has for his father's house, his body, the church, that's a zeal for you. Jesus' zeal for you, his love for you, consumes him. It's a powerful thing to think about. Jesus loves and treasures you so much. He loves and treasures his church, the body, so much that it consumes him. Like perhaps the love of a parent for a child. So this message is for you. Last week, Pastor Johnson talked about moving the goalposts. How Jesus moved the goalposts for us. Today, I'm talking to you today about how Jesus turns the tables. If you've heard that expression before, Jesus turns the tables on death. He turns the tables on Satan. He turns the table on our unrighteousness. So we'll look at that today. This is a beautiful picture. Child running through the field. Can you picture it? Her arms stretched out, pressing upon those reeds and the grass that's there in the field. A beautiful scene, peaceful scene. The sun is shining like any child in their kind of youthful innocence. They're filled with joy and play in that presence. If you can picture that for a moment, how serene, how peaceful that is. And then in a moment, it's interrupted. That peace is interrupted by a father who is yelling stretching his vocal cords, perhaps even the, the veins on his neck flaring as he's yelling out. And that child in that instant might have experienced like concern, surprise. Maybe she'd never heard her father yell like that before. It interrupts the peace that she found herself in by the father yelling. And maybe she thought the father was yelling at her. But then we realize, if you can picture this story, that off to the side, off from the reeds and the fields, is a mountain lion that's prowling and the father sees it. What would a father do or a mother do or a parent do? What would you do if it was your child? You'd yell out. You'd run for them. You'd place yourself in front of that lion, all for the sake of your child. Your zeal, your passion, your love would consume you and you would place yourself in front of them. This is the picture I see today when Jesus enters the temple. His love for his church, the body, his love for you consumed him. So as Jesus comes into the temple on this day, this was on Passover. And Passover, we know, that was a feast, a celebration, remembering when the angel of death passed over the houses in Egypt, the times of Moses. People would mark their door with blood, and the angel of death passed over. So Jesus, as he comes up to the city of Jerusalem, as he comes into the temple on this occasion, on this Passover time, Jesus is met inside the temple, in the temple, He's met by a huge crowd of people who are buying and selling, exchanging coins and finances. 
selling animals for the sake of sacrifice. Now, all of that had a purpose. It was a convenience for the people. It was necessary even. People would travel from far away to come to the holy city of Jerusalem, to come to the temple, and they couldn't perhaps bring animals with them all that way so they could buy the animals there. It was a convenience. They could exchange the money. Exchanging that Roman coin with Caesar's face on it for a Hebrew shekel without image on it to use an offering. So there was a purpose for this. You see, the problem, though, that Jesus identifies is in the temple that they're inside this house of worship, the body, the temple. All this was happening, pressing into the temple. Jesus desired for his temple, his body, even today, the church, to be a place of prayer and worship, a place where the gospel is proclaimed. And all those money changers were pushing people out of the way for the sake of exploiting the poor and making money off of others and selling, buying, selling. The heart was far from God in that expression. Now, outside of the temple was the place for that. In the temple, displacing others who needed to hear of the Messiah who was to come was interrupted by this expression. Jesus makes it clear that he wants for his body, the temple, today his church, who you are. You are the church, his people. He wants us to be ones that express this good news of the gospel freely and clearly. Not to have things hinder that, but what hinders us today from that? That zeal that Jesus has for the gospel to be proclaimed. The Messiah who was to come, and now for us, the Messiah who is revealed. What hinders us in the temple, in the church, in the body from being able to express that same thing that Jesus has a zeal and a passion for? This is what we see on that morning, on that Passover as Jesus came into the temple. And so it's not lost on us, the fact that Jesus, as he comes in, and, and it's really kind of a chaotic scene as he's overturning the tables, as he's driving out those who were selling these animals. Keep in mind, these animals were used in sacrifices. People trying to atone for their sin. But what we recognize is Jesus was preparing for a time where he would be the final sacrifice. Where his blood, his sacrifice would cover you in a perfect way. So that no more sacrifices would need to be brought before God. Jesus would be the ultimate and the final sacrifice. He would be the Passover lamb who would die for you. This is what he was preparing for. As he came into that temple court, as people were buying and selling, he had his eyes fixed on knowing what he would accomplish for you. He drove those animals out of the temple, preparing to be the sacrifice for each of us. And so, as he drove them from the temple, the words, the terms that are used here in the text, it really re relates to and reflects how we see Jesus driving out or casting out demons several times in the texts. Jesus drove them out of the temple. In other words, they had no place precluding or excluding or keeping people from hearing the gospel, the Messiah to come. The focus, the heart was on the wrong thing. What we see about this is Jesus fashioned a whip. It seems perhaps like uncharacteristic, once again, of Jesus to do that. But he fashioned a whip out of cords on the ground or somewhere in the temple. And he began to drive these things out of the temple, out of the presence of the body. It's not lost on us once again that we see this foreshadowing as Jesus used a whip to drive these things out that would separate us, the heart from God. A whip would be turned upon him, representing God's wrath, his punishment for our sin would be placed upon Jesus. Jesus would be whipped, striped, beaten. Only this whip would be with shards of bone, sharp, cutting deep. Jesus, who weld, weld the whip, would face the whip for the sake of you 
and I for the wrath of God for his punishment to be poured out upon him for us. All the while, Jesus knew what he was doing. And then he told those who were gathered there, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade or a den of thieves later on in other synoptic gospels later on at a perhaps even a different Passover or the same either way. This is where we see Jesus turning the tables. So last week it was moving the goalposts. This week it's Jesus turning the tables. You know, in that expression, when you hear that, you always think about the weaker party gaining when the tables are turned, they gain an advantage. Or now they're in a position of strength. In this case, as Jesus overturned those tables, as Jesus turns the tables, he turns the tables for you and for me. He takes us as unrighteous ones and makes us, declares us righteous on account of him. He turned the tables where the people required and need to offer sacrifice after sacrifice and they could never be enough and it was never enough. And I face this all the time where people still find themselves caught in, caught in that quandary of trying to be good enough for God. Not sure if they are. And yet Jesus turns the tables. He takes our unrighteousness, which all of us are. All of us are sinners caught up in it. But Jesus takes that and makes us righteous on account of his death for you. He turns the tables. But more than that, he turns the tables against all the devil's plans to use his death to put an end to the movement. Jesus instead has victory over death and the resurrection. He turns the tables on Satan. He turns the tables on death and the resurrection. He turns the tables for you. As those coins spilled out upon the temple floor in that court that day, it's a reflection, a reminder of how Judas would go to betray Jesus in that last supper in that garden that evening as he brought that crowd there to take him away, being sold for 30 silver coins. Later, Judas would go and throw those coins at the high priest's feet. Coins being spilled once again. But in this case, Jesus knew what he was doing. He was turning the tables for you and for me. So the Jews said to him, what signs do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. I will raise it up. We know what Jesus was talking about. In that time, perhaps it was confusing because their focus was on this physical building, this physical temple. You mean you're going to destroy this temple that took decades to build, Jesus? Is that what you're saying? And of course, we know that Jesus was referring to his, his body. That they would destroy his body. They would destroy it. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. He would die for us. He would die for you. But three days later, even before it happens, Jesus tells them so that they will know the truth of what he's come to do. Again, he reveals our heart, but he reveals his heart for us. His love for us. So in this text, although it seems maybe uncharacteristic how Jesus came in with this zeal, the zeal really is a passion for his body. It's a passion for you. As Jesus would walk towards that mountain, as he walked towards Golgotha, as he was clinging and holding to the cross, he was planning and was embracing you. His zeal his passion and love for his body, for you, it's as if he was carrying us, holding and embracing you while he was holding that cross, preparing to do what only he could do for you. Now the Pharisees on that day, their eyes were fixed, fixed on location. Their eyes were fixed on what could be seen. Their eyes were fixed on external righteousness. Now, some people hear this text and they twist it and use it in such a way to say, well, we need to keep this, this house, this church holy, so we shouldn't have drums and guitars and such. 
But we shouldn't allow for messy people to enter the church. We shouldn't allow for the broken or the hurting or the poor or the homeless or the addict to become part of the church. It needs to be a very special place. This was the focus of the Pharisees. They were focused on external things. But Jesus made it clear that it's matters of the heart. It's not matters of location. It's not matters of perfection. It's matters of heart. He wants hearts. He wants your heart. You'll remember even Jesus telling this parable about this Pharisee and a tax collector. And in his, par his parable, the story, he says that the, the Pharisee was coming to this place of prayer expressing all the good that he had done. And I'm thankful that I'm not like that tax collector. Whereas the tax collector was crying out to God to be merciful to him, a poor sinner. That's where you and I find ourselves, like that tax collector, recognizing how much we need him. See, Jesus knew it was about matters of the heart, and that's why he tells this story. And that's why he came into the temple that day because it wasn't about external righteousness. It was about being justified by grace through faith, by his sacrifice for you. He makes you right. But the Pharisees were focused on the external, the righteousness that was seen. They would even wear these phylacteries that they would place upon their foreheads and their arms where they would even physically contain the scriptures to show how righteous they were, how pure they were. But Jesus addressed this with, with them. And he said to those scribes and Pharisees, Woe to you! You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness, unrighteousness. And ultimately, we all find ourselves there. We're all, we don't measure up to God. No matter how many sacrifices we offer, it could never be enough. Jesus was identifying matters of the heart in the temple that day, and he still does for us today. Why? Does he want to stop people from trying to be righteous, holy? Clearly not. He wants people's hearts so that he can reassure them of what he's accomplished for them. So we see this. As he addresses it with the Pharisees, it wasn't about locale. It wasn't about external righteousness. It wasn't about having pews in the church or an organ in the balcony. Those are all great things, but we see even in the early church, if that was the case, they would all be excluded because they met in homes and in public places. And even today, we see how the gospel goes out, gathering people in the underground church gathering people in homes as they're proclaiming the good news. The zeal that Jesus had on that day was for his church, for his people, his body. And the same zeal is expressed in churches all over the place, in all different locales, in all different settings. Jesus wants the gospel to go out because it's that good, because it reveals his heart. And ultimately, the reason why Jesus wants your heart it is not for your works, not for anything you can offer to him. He wants your heart, your trust in him so that you never doubt what he's accomplished for you, what he has done for you. It's why he had zeal that day, why he had a love for his father's house, the church, why he continues to have a love for the church, which he instituted which is his body, which are you. Jesus has a zeal for you. And he has turned the tables against all in this world that would seek to separate you. He has turned the tables. He's taken our unrighteousness and made you righteous on account of him. Jesus' heart exchanged for yours. His love for you, his zeal revealed on this day. And every day, the gospel comes to us. And just like those who were gathered that day, witnessing what Jesus did in the temple courts, as he reflected upon, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, 
Sure enough, Jesus did. And in the resurrection, as they reflected upon it, we do as well. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said this. And they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Lord, help us to do the same. Strengthen us in faith to follow and trust you, to turn our hearts to you, because you have turned your hearts towards us. Your zeal, your love, your passion, God, is for us. It's for you. Thanks be to God.